There's something about autumn which draws me to be outdoors, and by the water in particular. Even if I haven't been fishing regularly throughout the rest of the year, as soon as the days start getting noticeably shorter, a kind of urgency is triggered in me to enjoy what's left before the bitterness of winter sets in. The problem for me is that the sessions, just like the season, come to an end too soon. Whether it's an overnight, 48 hours or even a week, when the conditions feel right then no amount of time on the bank seems long enough and leaving the water to return to the normality of everyday life can be heartbreaking. But have you ever considered what life might be like if you didn't have to leave? Have you ever imagined leaving your 9 to 5 behind and just going fishing, whenever, wherever you want? Well that's exactly what my friend Alex did a few years back and it's a journey he's still on today. Alex and I have been speaking about fishing together for a couple of years previously but with a busy work and family schedule finding the time seemed impossible and I knew I'd have to make time if this was ever going to happen. Eventually, an opportunity presented itself and after booking a train crossing and loading both the car and its roof box, I set a course for the Alps where I planned to interview Alex about his life over the last few years which has seen him travelling around Europe in a van he'd converted into a home on wheels and fishing some of the most beautiful yet wild and challenging waters along the way. After driving from 4pm right through the night until around 11am the following morning, I was tired and should have planned a rest somewhere to break the journey up. As soon as the sun was up and those majestic mountains appeared on the horizon, I was spurred on to get to my destination, reacquaint myself with Alex who was already set up at the water and unload the car before nightfall. Things got off to a typical start for me. I'd left the key to the roof box back at home, meaning it was locked with my bivvy, a tripod and a few other bits inside. Luckily, Alex had brought a spare shelter with him which I would be able to use and I'd packed a second tripod in the car itself. Whatever else I'd left locked in the roof box I'd have to do without, and after loading the barrow, we made our way round to the discreet little swim Alex had cut into a deep reed bed, roughly halfway up the length of the lake. Arriving in the swim, Alex chose to put his rods out using his small inflatable boat. I tried to film from the off, capturing some shaky footage, but after the drive, the barrow round and setting up camp, I was almost delirious and eventually gave in to exhaustion, making the executive decision to put the camera away and organise my kit ready for the following day, when I'd get the chance to wet alarm myself and maybe come face to face with one of the inhabitants of this stunning alpine water. I crashed out just as it got dark and it wasn't long before I was sound asleep and dreaming of the huge uncaught mountain mirrors and commons that would be hopefully feasting on the generous spread of boilies Alex had put out in a line between our two markers. We'd both awoken just before first light, and before a camera had even been switched on, We'd each took it in turns to go out in the boat and drop rigs along a line between the two markers where Alex had baited fairly heavily the night before. After a breakfast of fresh fruit and herbal tea for Alex, an instant porridge washed down with a couple of cups of coffee for me, the rest of the day was spent watching the water, taking in our surroundings, prepping bait, tying rigs and generally catching up as friends do. Freedom, yeah that's what it's got to be. Freedom, no more evil philosophy. Elevation, rearranging the groove High fidelity melodies to remedy the blues Freedom, yeah that's what it's got to be Come on, freedom, no more evil philosophy Elevation, rearranging the groove High fidelity melodies to remedy the blues Ethereal material inside my insides Inside excites a melody to live life Right to walk, a right to breathe Right to live despite the mind that's working to bleed Consciousness of the notion and the knowledge Those with opening eyes slowly find in the courage Heart residing inside of my chest When I listen from within it, life's limit is less Yes, my best guess, test trustworthy There's a lesson manifest in life Must live free and stay free the tides Despite us seeing plenty of fish activity in our area The first full day of fishing didn't produce a bite for either of us As anglers, we naturally speculated as to why this might have been But unable to draw any real conclusions and undeterred we reeled in for the evening before applying another spread of bait between the markers. We were up again at first light, and in the cool morning mist we boated our rigs out to our spots between the markers, lowering each one down before baiting each one with a handful of free offerings. Judging by the sheets of bubbles we noticed coming up as we were placing our rigs, the fish were obviously enjoying what we had given them the night before. 
so why hadn't they picked up a hook bait yet? Alex seemed calm and undeterred, so with a pair of rods each back out on the spots and the morning's breakfast lying in our bellies, I decided now would be a good time to record Alex talking about the journey he's been on for the last few years. A journey which has taken him throughout some of the most beautiful parts of Europe, to places where many anglers would give their right arm just to fish for a week, and Alex was able to fish them for as long as he wanted. With a few years worth of experience to condense into one interview, and a sense that we'd take many side tracks along the way, we began at an obvious point, the start, and particularly, what had inspired Alex to embark on his journey. Primarily it was absolutely a love of fishing, a real obsession with fishing and um, being outside as much as possible. That kind of drew me towards uh, packing it all in and just going on an adventure really. Um, uh, apart from that, not, uh, you know, never really gelling with the whole uh, nine to five way of living. And I always felt that I was being robbed of my time and uh, and money didn't seem to have the kind of, um, I don't know how to put it, but it didn't allure me really. Once once uh, I'd realized that it, it kind of didn't really fulfill me, I think um, my focus was much more on what can I do with my time rather than how much money I could make or it, it, ne it never really um, satisfied my soul, like being by the water did. Yeah. So I think um, I was really fortunate to, like many people, to have founded a relationship with nature from the perspective of fishing through angling because um, it really does draw you in a great deal more than just walking out and being out in nature. There's something, there is some, something metaphorical about having a line lowered into the water and how you're kind of fishing for answers. The carp are the answers in some circumstances and then other times it's just having a line in the water that, that can, um, I don't know, uh, send you into a deep state of meditation, I guess. Aside from the fishing, Alex is a talented musician and performer with many strings to his bow. Before we went much further with the interview, I asked Alex to paint a picture of what life was like before he'd even conceived the idea of starting out on the journey that he's on now. I was quite busy running my own business, so I taught music and did informal education, music therapy, and I was working um, quite a lot of hours doing that, but I never felt like I was really working because it was such a, a pleasurable thing to do. Um, engaging young people with music, working with disabled, working with deaf, blind, you know, and um, even in prisons, doing music therapy and, um, wow. That sounded like a good, good fishy. Um, yeah, and it was, and to some extent, you know, it's um, something that I'll always probably want to do you know, involve myself in music and um, working with with any, you know, anyone really who's interested in doing music because it's just such a great way of engaging with people. Um, so I was doing that, running that full time and um, fishing occasionally, not really um, any, I think, you know, fishing for five days at a time, that felt like a really long session to me at the time. And um, yeah, that was kind of my life. and. And um, so gigging at the weekend, working during the week, uh, running music sessions, producing music, putting out my own music and um, anything to do with music, really diversity to, to stay alive as a musician or to, to, to support yourself. You kind of got to do lots of different things. Um, and that's what I did because it beat working in a factory. Listen up, listen up. The vibe has got groove. The rhythm delivering peace. The vision is peace. Nobody can stop truth. Give it up, give it up. No separation. Elevating a mind state life is giving inspiration. Listen With all that work going on to keep him busy, I wondered if it was simply a desire to fish more, which was the catalyst behind Alex wanting to leave his life in the UK, or if there was a more significant driving force behind his decision. Yeah, I guess a year before, maybe up to a year and a half before actually setting off and even thinking about going on this journey, it was really um, ill health that sparked my uh, imagination wild because uh, being really brutally sick for bedridden for the best part of nine months just gave me such deep insight into, um, 
how important health is. It's, it's the number one, you know, health is so important. And when, when it's compromised, life is, is not so enjoyable anymore, you know, and um, a lot of the things that I found fulfilling, I couldn't do. Fishing even, you know, I couldn't even go to the bat. I couldn't, I couldn't lift a rod, to, you know, I was that weak and that ill. And um, so I couldn't even really go to the water for therapy at the time, you know, and uh, just just crawling from from the bed was a, was a, was a struggle. So having um, had that experience and that insight, I realised I really wanted to live my life. Like I really wanted to do absolutely everything that I was passionate about and not compromise on anything, you know, and find a way to do that. Um, to basically give myself time um, because we give up a lot of our time for money, I guess for the most part. And I was thinking, how can I live on the minimal amount of money and buy myself a lot of time? And, and um, I can't remember how it happened, but I remember seeing a picture of a converted van and that was it, I, I, I was just, you know, blown away that this could be possible. You could basically fit a house into a van. And, and so I, it, I just started to dream and think more about it from that point and then talked with my partner at the time about it. And we decided it, like, that we would do it, you know, and give it, give it a shot. And um, yeah, and so then that formulated uh, looking for a van and, and the arduous uh, task of building it with no DIY skills or, you know, learning on the job, so to speak. And um, it was a challenge because I was still kind of coming out of ill health too. So I didn't, I, you know, there would be days where I'd still be needing to be bedridden and then other times I would be out there working on it and, um, and putting it together. And over the space of, I guess, four months of quite intensive um, building work, it kind of came about and uh, we set off. With a life-changing motive and a van bought and painstakingly converted into a mobile home, I now knew why Alex wanted to take the leap and how he was going to do it. I struggle with decision making when there's only two options, so with potentially unlimited freedom, I wondered where Alex decided to head for first. It worked out like this, um, because for the last, sort of, well it's been 10 years now, I've been um, gigging and touring in the French Alps and around Europe in lots of different places. and. Um, I'd kind of fallen in love with a, a place in the mountains, having had the opportunity to do some gigs there. And um, when I first set eyes on it, I was like, I've got to come back and live here somehow, you know, and it's uh, a pretty expensive place to live and I'd never be able to afford to either own a property or even pay rent there. You know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a pricey place to live. And um, so I didn't know how I was going to end up living there, but I know when I first kind of saw it, I was like, I just have to come here. And um, so when we built the van, that was kind of where we headed for, uh, because I knew that I could work and do some shows. And then after that winter had passed, I knew that we'd hit the road and see what we could find and go on an adventure. Um, and that's exactly what we did. It was February when we actually left. so. Um, a lot of the lakes are frozen in this area, or well, especially that on that particular year it was quite a cold one. So the lakes had all had thick ice over the top. So it wasn't until spring that they'd melted, and um, that was when I just got straight on the lakes, and it was the best experience in my life. You know, just that that first moment of arriving at the lake and knowing that I had a month, if I wanted, you know, two months if I wanted. It was unlike anything I've ever experienced. You know. It, Five days always used to feel like, wow, I'm going to fish for five days. This is freedom, real freedom. But, you know, after you've been there for two weeks, three weeks, your mind changes, your perception changes, everything changes. And you brought deeper into that place. And um, it's, it, I can only describe it as, you know, just something utterly transcendental. It was just such a, an amazing experience. You know, I was just buzzing, buzzing, buzzing to, to and have the opportunity to fish for such wonderful fish as well. Beautiful fish and um, in relatively wild settings, you know, it, it was um, and still is a bloody gift. 
Fishing these wild European waters usually requires a step up in both tactics and tackle for most UK anglers. Knowing that prior to setting out on this journey, Alex had very little experience fishing long sessions on larger or more testing waters than he'd ever fished before. I wondered if he'd been prepared for the challenges he might have faced along the way. I, not really, you know, other than, you know, having to put baits out with boats and getting used to it and um, not really, not a great deal of change, to be fair. It's hard to even put myself back into that mentality, you know, I, just, I think I was probably fishing very similar to how I would have fished in the UK. Um, so, to be honest, I don't really didn't change a lot. I didn't have any different, my gear was still the same, you know, I, I still used exactly the same gear. I didn't even step up my line to start with because just just fished with 15 pound line. It wasn't until like, you know, encountering much snaggier waters that things changed. Um, things like having a fish finder, having a boat, you know, just stupid things like needing a boat, not having very much money to get a boat, looking for a cheap option and not really knowing um, <laughs> how easy a big boat would be to manoeuvre by myself and things like that, making those kind of mistakes, buying a too big a boat to start with and um, not having strong enough tackle and, you know, those sort of simple mistakes. Um, fish Having a fish finder being quite very, quite helpful on the really, really big waters, you know, just little bits of tech, technical gear that make a big difference when you, you come up against a really big water and a challenging place. New experiences coupled with steep learning curves can often make for some memorable chapters in our lives. I was intrigued to find out more about the first year or so of Alex's travels and experiences and asked him if he could recall some of his highlights from the early days of what Alex has since dubbed Operation Freedom. I think it, it's almost be, it was being in this region really, um, just being surrounded by the mountains and um, kind of having these lakes fairly to myself and I think m some of the most memorable moments have, have been you know getting a run in the middle of the night and um, and having the stars all above you and the mountains all around and just being out in the middle of the lake you know not knowing what the hell you're attached to and, and just looking up and just being blown away by that moment that most people are in bed you know and you're there experiencing this incredible sky and uh, panorama of mountains and I just remember just thinking, wow, I'm so bloody lucky to be doing this, you know, and and to not have it snatched from me to in, in the sense that, oh, you know, in three or four days time, this comes to an end and I've got to go back that dread feeling of having to go back to doing something that perhaps is less enjoyable than just being by the lake and um, not having to have that that kind of um, deadline or imposing um, finishing point was always such a it's just it made me laugh you know I'd la laugh with how great that was not having to stop because <laughs> I didn't want to and I, the, the thing the thing was I became quite um, obsessed with being there as you would do as anyone would be so like being there for a month or two I, yeah you know it was quite easy to do I've begun to wonder now that his journey was well underway what was keeping the fire burning Alex has never seemed like the kind of guy to be hell-bent on catching a particular carp or to be playing the numbers game in terms of size or quantity of carp he's caught. In fact, I can't recall ever noticing him mention the weight of a fish, be that in his writings or on any of his posts on social media. With that on my mind, I asked Alex whether the carp were his motivation or whether it was more about the experience of just being there. It's all, that is always the main reason, really. Like, um, Don't get me wrong, I've, I definitely have put cast the line into some not as um, appealing lakes in my life, but um, it's always been as wild as, and as solitary as I could find, you know, and um, fortunately, since starting this journey, there's there's no shortage of those kind of places. So I've been really blessed to be able to find those kind of waters. And obviously when, when you start seeing beautiful, sizable fish jumping over your spot it you definitely get excited and um, for sure can become very focused on the fishing um, but I always seem to maintain this awareness of the place I'm in you know and that, that that's for me is is kind of paramount um, beautiful places just make for beautiful experiences and um, it's what I'm drawn to
Not knowing where to take the interview at this point, we chatted for some time off camera until I realised there was something I hadn't asked in terms of Alex's initial thoughts when first setting off on Operation Freedom. A wise man once said, part of the journey is the end. Alex had been on his journey for nearly five years and I wondered if he had set out with a particular end goal in mind. No, there wasn't an end goal. Uh, I could see that it was a transition because I'd already changed my mind about a lot of things. I'd already realised that I didn't need a lot of things that I'd thought I needed. You know, the house, the car, this is the money, the, the, all, the, all those things that are kind of, I guess, society is geared for. Um, I realised it was a case of just changing my mind about those things. It wasn't necessarily a case of any physical change. It was just, oh yeah, those things aren't fulfilling me on the level at which I thought they might. Um, and so, why not try this? But I had no sort of like, well, I'll do it for a year and then I'll get a proper job or whatever. You know, um, it was kind of like, here we go. <laughs> In at the deep end and see what happens. Despite throwing himself in at the deep end, it's obvious to see from Alex's social media postings as carp watercraft that he's a capable angler who's caught some incredible carp from a variety of waters. However, I noticed during our session there was no sense of desperation to catch or even urgency from Alex, just a calm, confident, it will happen when it happens kind of attitude. I asked how important to him it is to catch. Maybe it's not the news that everyone wants to hear, but it's been much less about the fishing and capturing of the fish than it has been about having the opportunity to really immerse myself in these places, you know, and um, just uh, get to experience what that's really like, to spend a prolonged amount of time, I, sometimes isolated, sometimes with my partner, Patricia, and, um, and just to really get a taste of what it's like to, to, to live by a lake. Because there's one thing turning up with all your gear and fishing for a few nights, which is all I ever used to do, but it's, slightly, it's, a, it's a different world when when you get to spend a month, you know, 40 nights straight fishing, it's, it totally changes um, the meaning of what angling is and fishing, you know, for me it has anyway. And um, it becomes something that you just can't really translate into words. It's like a, it's a feeling rather than um, something conceptual. So we're hoping to get what? A black bass. A black bass. Oh, as she go, watching this. As she go. But they're not too interested in my rubber fishy from the Chinese shop. Really, even at the, from the very beginning, some of the highlights, which is as bizarre as it sounds, were was collecting firewood and building a fire and prepping particles on it or um, cooking on it, catching fish and eating them, crayfish and eating them, and p various plants and herbs and and just getting a fit, like those, those simple tasks kind of drew me much deeper into my experience. Just the fishing is one way of connecting with the environment, definitely. And that, was, that has been the main kind of reason for all of it. And um, the thing that's weaved everything together, but um, just those simple sort of ch chores or tasks that have been between the fishing, collecting wood, collecting food, um, yeah, look, observing the, the nature around me, those, those moments have been really highlights for me. You know, certain sunrises or sunsets have just, you know, almost brought me to tears because of how um, appreciative I, I had become of those moments. The longer I'm there, the less I'm thinking about, you know, the well outside of being at the lake. And um, it, it's definitely had an effect, whether someone would say that was beneficial or not. I don't know, but for me, internally, it has been incredibly beneficial. Um, I just think it's made me very grateful and um, to, have, to, to be able to experience that, you know. And, um, and of course, to add, there have been like a few moments where I actually targeted fish and was able to capture them, and I've never done that in my life before. You know, I've never really sort of targeted anything. I've always kind of turned up and fished for whatever I was fortunate enough to catch. Um, so to catch a fish that I wanted to catch, that was quite a, an amazing moment um, in addition to just getting the opportunity to, to fish a lot. by 
Wanderlust, Operation Freedom was hardly going to be just a tour of what France had to offer angling-wise. I knew, like anyone who follows Cat Watchcraft on social media probably does too, that his journey has taken him to many countries around Europe, with varying levels of carp catching success. So I asked Alex if he could recall the places he'd fished during Operation Freedom. Well, obviously it started out in the UK and um, and then uh, France. And, and to be honest, my knowledge of lakes and places to fish was non-existent before I even came to France. So I, I didn't have the knowledge of a lot of the UK anglers that don't even go abroad. They know X, Y and Z lakes in France and, and Italy and Spain and they are aware of these places. I hadn't, I only, the only lake I knew of was Cassian. That is all I knew about because I'd, I'd heard about it through, you know, some hand-me-down carp mags that I'd read when I was 17. But that, that was the extent of my knowledge. So I was really going into it blind. Mass, you know, I didn't know anywhere and I, I didn't research it either. And that was kind of, on some level, a choice. Um, of course, the information, we live in the information age, so of course I could have found out. But it was more going into it blind that I kind of liked the idea of, to be honest find it for myself you know rather than have someone say oh yeah this lake's really good there's these many fish in it this and that i wasn't interested in that because that's the mystery gone for me i don't want to know about it i want to find out for myself um maybe find out the hard way even um so it was yeah coming to france and and then traveling through france and literally finding places either on my own or speaking to someone and said oh you should try down there or this place or that you know um, um and then after that um, I met Patricia and we decided we'd both like to go and fish Italy so we, we travelled around Italy and fished there um, and then the next year it led on to Spain um, and then the year after that Portugal um, and we've had plenty of um, ideas to go further afield you know and there's definitely always uh, that on the cards um, but all of those places were fantastic for their own individual reasons. The reasons, the weathers, the climates, the, the people, the, the landscapes. They all present a different kind of challenge. Yes. Um, and uh, can be testing. I was interested to hear more about Alex's time spent in Spain and Portugal. Although the internet and social media have made the world a much smaller place, these are still two countries that you hear relatively little about when it comes to carp fishing. Although we know that they are home to some large bodies of water, with massive potential for fish to grow to monstrous proportions, which must make them an intriguing prospect for anglers prepared to put the time and effort in to find out. We had found ourselves in Spain, and we were fishing um, some of the big reservoirs there. And I guess uh, I didn't really gel with the place as much as I thought I might. I mean, it's in, they're incredible wildernesses, you know, they really are. You are out in the wild, you are out well away from civilization, and you are kind of um, at the mercy of, of the lake and where you're situated, you know. You can, you can have bad weather and you can be stuck there for some, some time, you know. We were very fortunate, we could never have got our van close to the lakes down that way and we were very fortunate to have some help, someone to four by four us down with all the gear and drop us off. We went off in the boat and we spent a month there. Um, you're, you're a good 30 miles away from the nearest town or something, or civilization, so to speak. But um, you're not allowed to night fish and you're in a reserve and there are guards and there is, you know, there is a bit of cat and mouse going on there and um, they put me on edge really. I, I kind of like to be relaxed. I don't really want to be watching over my shoulder. There was an element of like being very stealthy. We were hidden well away and fishing and, and um, you know, keeping an, our eyes peeled. But it didn't really, it didn't resonate with me like other places had done, you know. Um, I don't really want to say too many bad words about it because I know a lot of people really, really enjoy Spain and I, and I get it and I think it's a wonderful place and the people are wonderful and um, it's, it's just a different experience entirely. But we hadn't planned to go to Portugal, you know, and it was just that we were close to Portugal and it just sounded interesting. I'd always been a real um, into Latin music and kind of aspects of Portuguese culture and it just sort of spoke to me, the food, just from what I, the little I knew. So we decided we'd just continue and go across the border. And I, I, it was funny, we, we were crossing the border in the middle of the night and um, we were pretty knackered. We'd done 45 nights straight or something like that. Um, and we'd had some really lovely fish. In fact, we'd had some of the most beautiful fish I'd ever caught, just really big, the dark, scaly um, 
specimens, you know, they, they were some of the most beautiful fish I'd ever seen. And um, we crossed in the middle of the night and we were knackered and we were kind of a little bit like uh, t agitated. And the minute we crossed the border in the middle of the night, and it's an imaginary line between two countries, there's nothing more that, you know, than it's an imaginary line. But we crossed this border, there was no sign really to sort of suggest that we had, just the GPS. And um, we instantly felt, both of us kind of looked at each other and we were just kind of like, ah, oh, wow, I'm really happy to be here. For some reason, we just felt really relieved. And we pulled up to the first town in the middle of the night and it was just, um, you know, these whitewashed buildings with blue frames and orange trees growing down the street. And there was something really welcoming about it. We pulled up to the Alcava Dam, which is the, one of the biggest dams in Europe. Uh, I, I think it's bigger than 10,000 hectares. Um, and it just, there was something about all of it that just felt really right. And, um, and then from that moment onwards, we sort of just navigated our way down along the coast and just um, got stuck in, really just met some amazing people from the off and really welcomed. And Patricia was desperate to see the sea. So we, we went, we didn't fish for the first month in Portugal. We, we kind of just, just had a chill, you know, for a month and found our energy and enthusiasm again. And then um, we did that, just that we, you know, we were there. I can't remember when we crossed it, it was sometime around December, November, December. We had beautiful sunshine and we were on the beach, you know, just sunbathing and, um, and trying the local foods and meeting people. And that was just a, a wonderful experience. And then, um, then we went to the first sort of lake and, and were very, very fortunate to catch some fish quite quick on and some good fish too. And, um, and it just kind of went from there really. Um, we stayed, we hadn't planned to stay, you know, for any amount of time, but it ended up being almost a year, you know, by the time we left. And, and many experiences, you know, filled that year. And we were obviously documenting it as we went. Um, and I, we, we, had, we didn't really t touch the footage until, well, I didn't really start looking at the footage until a couple of months ago. So I started compiling and, you know, looking over what, we, what we'd captured. And um, there's a hell of a lot of interesting stuff there. And I guess um, I want to approach this film slightly differently in that I want to make it more about our experiences rather than, you know, loads of beautiful imagery and a kind of a, a bit of a narrative. I want it to be a bit more about how it was, you know, and um, the kind of things we experienced, the ups and the downs and all of that. And um, hopefully that will come across. Um, but. It, what I've kind of discovered is that it is fairly untapped for fishing, really. I mean, um, there's hardly anyone fishing there. And there's a lot of, a lot of potential, you know. There's no reason why the carp won't um, be as prolific as anywhere else. It's just that they're, you know, a mainstay of food there. <laughs> a bit like in Spain and other places, you know, the, food, the carp get eaten and netted quite a lot. So I think a lot of the bigger fish do end up in people's bellies. Um, but there are places where that isn't the case and you know we were very fortunate to see a lot of good fish out there not necessarily ones we always caught but we saw them you know and know that they're there and um, and these places are wild really you know there's there's not really any interest in catching some of these fish or the fishing and it really makes us some, re some really interesting um, backdrops and landscapes and atmospheres to to be to be in so uh, yeah is there a have you sort of got a deadline for yourself as to when that's going to come out or is that just that when it's ready? Yeah, you got it when it's ready. <laughs> it's hard to say when the cookie's baked, man. <laughs> but um, I guess when, when I feel like um, it, it's, it, it all gels together. Because as you probably know, it's not an easy thing to, to get the right music and the, the right sequence of um, film and, and the narrative to be really cohesive and gel as something, you know, um, captivating to make to kind of make your dream really into this into this piece of uh, art or whatever you want to call it
despite outwardly looking like the ultimate carpus fantasy, life on the bank and sometimes on the road is still life, and as we all know, people's lives aren't always as plain sailing as it may seem from the outside looking in. I asked Alex to describe some of the biggest issues he faces by choosing to live and fish in this way. Sometimes it's been hard financially, I, I won't lie, that's the situation I put myself into, that is part of the challenge, is getting by on very little, okay, we have got this much money, um, what can we do to, you know, get some more food, okay, what we'll do is we'll catch fish and we'll forage much more, try and supplement our diet with a bit more food, um, and just do cut corners <laughs> in places, you know, to get by. And it's kind of that being on the edge a little bit that makes the experience more um, tangible, you know. I've, you know, you know, no one wants to go through life, although we might think we do, want to go through life just plain sailing and not have any dynamics and it be like always good because it isn't always good and it's really important to have the ups and the downs as you, as we all know because they're the frames of reference when you've had a really tough time you really appreciate really appreciate when it's good you know and um so yeah i'm grateful for those moments I'm trying to see other things come to mind um Yeah, that happened once. I gave in. I, I was fishing in Italy. I, I, I went there by myself in November. <laughs> and um, I kind of was a bit expectant because I'd had some good success on this water in the spring and the summer. And uh, I thought I knew I was going to, you know, catch some fish and it was going to be great. And uh, I turned up and and the weather was a beautiful blue skies. But unfortunately, where this lake was situated, every day like the sun had just come over the hill and it, the whole place would go white with mist and it would be like that till the evening and it was like that for two solid weeks you know just in mist so really gloomy every day and um and i wasn't getting the bites i wasn't getting any any bites in fact oh and i was moving and i was trying really hard and i was actually i had we had norman at the time still so we had the pigeon and uh, he was <laughs> keeping me company um <laughs> but i was basically blanking my balls off and, and it was really hard to find the motivation, you know, and I, like a week in, I'd not caught a fish and um, oh, apart from a bream. And, uh, and then it started, got to 10 days and I'd moved a couple of times and, and it was kind of grating on me. And at two weeks, I got my first bite. I was so relieved to catch this fish, you know, it was a beautiful common, absolutely immaculate. And I was like, yeah, OK, I've caught a fish now. It's like now I, I'm cool. But I, I think I think I ended up staying, you know, and another few more days uh, no another week in fact and um, no more fish and uh, it, I was broken I just uh, I couldn't stay there any longer you know I just <laughs> I'd been beaten it kicked my ass um, and that was that, that was when I literally turned home and just thought you know what I'm done I'm gonna go back and see Patricia and, uh, and give it you know call it a day um, <laughs> um, and I think it, it was going there with expectations that was the thing that tripped me up um, because the thing was other people were catching as well. You know, there were other anglers around the lake fishing and the, the trouble is you always hear through the bailiff or someone come around, oh, you know, you're not catching one matey boy over there. Oh, he had a, an absolute lump last night and this and that. And it does, information can wreck your fishing. Or, or it can wreck my fishing. That's why I arrive and know nothing. If someone's bagging up down the, I don't care. I'd rather not know in a way because, um, I'm con I can be really content not catching, but if I think that if, if if I think that you know that I'm not catching because I'm not doing the, the right thing, then of course I'm going to want to get I get itchy and I want to change it and not be patient because um, I you know I I am here behind the rods and it is nice to catch fish as much as I harp on about it all about it just being there because I'm still connected with that element you know. It is still nice to catch a fish. I'm, we're here fishing now. We've we're not we've not caught anything so far. You know, it's 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 been two nights. We've seen the fish there. We, we we're pretty certain. Well, we are sure they're they're crashing over the bait. We we we've got a feeling that we might get a bite any minute, but we've not got one yet. And uh, I'd really like you to catch one, I'd, and it would be really nice to catch one too. Um, it's not fundamental, but it's. Um, it would be a real treat, a blessing, if we, if we caught something. <laughs> with the carp still not playing ball and picking up our rigs, we carried on with the interview, and something I wanted to touch on was the subject of Norman, a wild pigeon who Alex had found in a bad way and nursed to health, 
which became a law companion and part of the Operation Freedom family. That was one of the highlights of our journey, I must admit, and probably one of the highlights of my life in a, in a very strange and unusual kind of way. I, 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 can't, I can't look at pigeons the same way as a result of that experience. I'm much like anyone else, I think, um, because pigeons are everywhere. They're kind of demonised in a way, you know, they're vermin or something and they're unclean. And um, I probably adopted that viewpoint to some extent. And uh, we were in Italy at the time. It was me and Patricia had only been together a couple of months and um, we were at Lago d'Otta, or yeah, I think that's how you say it, Otta. And um, we were just walking through the streets and we just, I, I clocked this small bird, you know, just down in, in, the, in the corner and um, we went over to it. And it was just sort of stood there looking like pretty unwell, to be honest. And, um, we, I thought, oh, I'd best not leave it there. Just put it in a flat, put it in a plant pot or something, just so it's off the ground. The cat will get it or something. And, um, and we sort of said, if it's there tomorrow, we'll, we'll, we'll go back and check and see if it's still there. Hopefully, you know, it will pair up with its family or whatever, and um, the mother will come and save it <laughs> or feed it or look after it. Anyway, long story short, we came around the next day and it was just it was on death's door. And Kind of being a bit naive, we thought, right, okay, we'll uh, we'll just take it back to the van and look after it. And for whatever reason, we thought that's what we were going to do, and not really with a, <laughs> a long-term th thought about what you know that might incur. So we did. We took him back to the van and we kept him warm and um, sort of gave him a bit of food, which he responded to, and a bit of water. And for the best part of a week, nursed him back to health. You know and. Uh, with each day he grew a little bit stronger. He spent the whole time sleeping, really, for a week in, in, a, in a tracker hat, believe it or not, <laughs> just like, you know, uh, in the corner of the van. And um, so he, he did perk up and then we realised, oh shit, you know, he's not going to survive in the world now. We can't, well, how are we gonna, where are we going to put him? He's like, he's, he's tiny, he's, you know, he's barely got any feathers. So we realised that we'd kind of take a bit off more than we could chew. So there, that you know, we named him Norman from the off, and we nursed him back to full health, and he just he, he just lived with us, you know, <laughs> he fully accepted us. I remember I remember the first time about two weeks in, he crawled out of his hat and came up and like put, sat on me and fell asleep on me, and I was like, oh mate, this is this is magic, you know, I've got this little creature that like has accepted us, and um, and then that was it. He was he was part of this journey, you know, and he he would. He would be on our shoulders and um, stay with us. You know, he he would literally stay on my shoulder or Patricia's shoulder wherever we walked or went into a shop or, you know, fishing out on the boat, whatever, wherever we were. He was with us the whole time, and then eventually he started to learn to fly. And we kind of encouraged him to fly by, you know, like letting him fly between each of us. And um, um, and and yeah, he grew stronger and developed his his uh, flight capacity and. <laughs> often it'd end up a bloody tree and we'd be waiting for hours for him to come down or we'd be in, you know, it was actually on this lake um, after we'd had him for quite some time, you know, it was going getting on for 10 months or something where we took off. We were in the middle of the lake, all the gear, tra traveling across the lake and Patricia was a little bit um, liberal, shall we say, with him because we uh, hit several times he'd done this in the past and we kind of knew not to let him fly off when we were in the boat because it just meant he was going to fly to the la fly back to the land because he doesn't he, he wouldn't have landed on the boat he'd just go straight back to the land and so anyway Patricia let him kind of fly off and it was like a oh, bugger you know he, off he flew down the lake you know 600 meters to the bank and um, so I started rowing up but this time it was harrowing because he was intercepted by some fat falcons um, and I've never felt such agonizing uh, fear in my life. And I can only imagine it's what a parent must feel like when they see their, their child, like, you know, in near danger. And um, th this falcon literally swooped in hard and, and I, I knew what, exactly what was gonna happen at that point and so did Patricia and she was howling and I was howling, pardon my French, I was howling and, and, and it was just like, I knew that he was just going to be taken to a tree and just being ripped apart and eaten. That is basically what the vision I had in my head, and I, it was just, oh, it, was, it was horrible. And um, something miraculous happened, and it really was a miracle. 
<laughs> crows started coming out of the, out of the forest and, and, and attack, not attacking, but swooping at the, the falcons. This was really a bizarre moment. And I, at that moment, I just started rowing like absolute hell. And, and as you know, with a boat full of gear, a big boat full of gear, you, can't, you, you don't have the energy to absolutely mack it down the lake. So I was rowing and after about 200 meters, my arms were going numb because I was fatigued. I was just, go, I, I, that was it. I was in my mind. I was like, I'm not stopping rowing. I was just absolutely like beside myself, rowing in between, shouting at the 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 the, the foul falcons. There was there, there was a few other anglers, um, you know, uh, pike and perch fishermen around the lake, and I was t top of my voice screaming at the falcons. They must have thought, "What the bloody hell is going on?" But um, yeah, miraculously, the the falcon let go of Norman because it had hit Norman. Feathers went everywhere, and 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 started taking Norman off. And you know, it was it was you know, game over is how I felt about it at the time. And, and some, for some reason, the crows put them off and they let go of Norman and he plummeted straight into the lake. I had no idea what shape he was in. So I just carried on rowing like hell down this lake. Patricia's still screaming. And we get within sort of 10 meters of Norman and he's there bobbing. I can't quite see if he's all right or he's alive still. And he just like nails it to us and flies up under my arms and he's shaking and like, you know, he's absolutely fearful basically and I'm like oh checking him over and he's got a few little cuts on him where the talons had gone but nothing deep nothing he, it was all sort of superficial <laughs> and we were so relieved to get him back man that 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 was a real experience we were so relieved to have that you know I I was I thought he was a goner but he, he definitely had a few lives and um he spent the next sort of 40 hours in, in the car in a cardboard box full of straw and didn't come out <laughs> um but yeah, that was a real near miss. Um, and there were plenty of others. There were plenty of others where um, we actually lost him for two weeks. We were in Italy a, for a second time fishing the same lake. And um, I think I'd, I'd gone off to get some supplies on the bike and Patricia had had a boat go through the lines and uh, she was dealing with that and Norman had he'd often wander off that was a thing he was free to come and go he was free and that was the way he had to be because it, it is a wild animal and we just took that risk and she said she turned around and he'd gone and she thought he'd just wandered off into the forest or something so um, when I got back she explained and we looked for him and we looked for him and Patricia became you know very upset and I was too um, but she thought she'd messed up you know and that he'd got gotten eaten or something you know two three days had rolled by in the end, we'd been there sort of 10 days and he'd gone. And in my mind, I was like, OK, well, we had a really wonderful journey with him. And um, that's it. That's the end of it. And um, just before we left, I don't know why, I just said to Patricia, look, just make a few posters. We'll stick them up around the lake. Look, we just, so she hand wrote out these posters in Italian. She, she, she's pretty good with languages. So she, she worked out how to translate this message and, you know, made these nice little flyers. And we went around this town just before we left and stuck them up and drove all the way back to France. And um, I can't remember what it was. It was like two or three days later. Patricia was still just gutted, crying. And she was so upset, you know, like I, she was, gutted and um, it, it was uh, it was it was kind of like a child for her really and in a, in a way for me you know he, he was an incredible it was an incredible experience to see the intelligence and the wisdom of, a, of another living being that wasn't human and um, I don't know why I did it but I just walked outside and I and I was really sad to see how cut up Patricia was and I kind of was like I don't know why, but I just sort of had an internal prayer of some kind. I was like, if Norman's still there, like if he's still alive, then um, like let him come back to us because I couldn't bear seeing Patricia so cut up. And within an hour, we got a text message and uh, someone has said, oh yeah, well, we found Norman and um, we've been looking after him for two weeks. He'd, he'd sort of, he was washed up in the, from the lake. He'd obviously flown and landed in the lake and bobbed to the edge. And by coincidence, um, an Italian ex-pigeon fancier had found him. So yeah, he took, took, took him in and, had, and cared for him because he knew what to do. He was a pigeon fancier. And, and then our message had kind of spread and he'd found out about it and got in touch. And so uh, we were reunited with Norman after a couple of weeks. 
And uh, yeah, that was a, a mad, I've actually got footage of, of Patricia receiving Norman off of this, this guy and uh, you know, being in tears and yeah, it was a beautiful moment. We were both completely gobsmacked, you know, that he, he, <laughs> that he was still alive, you know, and we could, we could continue the journey with him. And um, yeah, that was, a, that was a magic moment. And that was definitely an emotional journey. There's no doubt about it. And, and, and um, they were the two, two major incidences we had with Norman. And then I'm fine, I think he ran out of lives in the end. And Patricia's dad um, accidentally stood on him. And uh, pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty awful. They'd been out, they'd gone out for um, lunch, I think. And uh, Patricia's dad had had a few drinks. And um, Norman lived in their big open front room because when we were in Maribel, often we'd stay there or, um, you know, in between journeys, we'd go and recuperate there for a bit. And uh, his territory had been this big open fireplace. And uh, anyone who walked near, because he was a male, he's quite territorial, he'd run it and peck your legs. And he, I think he just, you know, had ran and pecked uh, jean Marie's foot and he'd not noticed and stood back and, and that was a serious head injury. And um, he went to the vets because he was still alive and they said, that, you know, there's a chance he could make a recovery. And it was, it was a bit tough because he wasn't in a good way. So we looked after him in the best way we knew how and the best, he survived the best part of a week. I was fishing at the time when all this had happened, so I wasn't there, but Patricia brought him down to the lake and joined me. And um, yeah, we, we, we wept pretty hard then, you know, seeing the state he was in and we were, we were quite cut up. And um, yeah, well, I, I remember waking up one night and hearing where we'd put him in a cage just to keep him still, you know, so he wasn't moving about the place or bumping because he needed to recover and he, and he wasn't going to pull through. And um, we knew that when he started having seizures in the middle of the night, it was like 3 a.m. and the, I woke up to the sound of the cage rattling and uh, I kind of clocked what was going on and picked him up and I was like, OK, Patricia, this is it. You know, he's, he's finally on his way out. So we sort of said our goodbyes and um, that was a real humbling experience, you know, to see the life sap, the leave another being. Um, sad, and obviously, I, I, even now talking about it, it kind of uh, presses my emotional buttons. But a real gift as well, you know, to realise that we all, before that, you know, we all go, we're all going to go through that at some point. And um, spent about five hours just bawling my eyes out. Uh, and and. And that, like I say, I never, never imagined I would become so emotionally attached to a pigeon. <laughs> but then it's like, you know, it might seem bizarre to someone to, to have a pigeon as a kind of, as a mate, but then a lot of people can relate to the love they feel for their, their animals, you know, a dog or a cat or, you know, and, and I think a lot of people become very emotionally attached to um, those beings as well. And they see the intelligence that, that lies within them and, and the consciousness that resides within those living beings and um, it's no it was no different with Norman you know they're they're incredibly intelligent they're in, um, they're incredible beings to 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 share a bit of time with because you, it brought me a real insight into the life of birds really um, a, a pigeon but like the birds in general they're they're quite incredible when you get to see them up close and and share time with them rather than just you know in passing by a lake you know and um, yeah, that was that was an amazing experience, and I guess a part of the journey that had to come to an end at some point, and um, something that I'm very grateful for. You know, it will be it would be a, a dream to maybe um, at some point again in the future <laughs> have an experience like that, but not something I would necessarily seek out. But it, it, to have that um, the capacity to care for other beings. The capacity, whether that's a human being or, you know, I think, I think if, if, if we were to reflect on what it is that we offer the planet as human beings, you know, what's our ecological function besides consuming? <laughs> um, I'd say it's to care, to care for the environment we're in. We have this capacity to, to, to offer that to the rest of the world. I think, you know, um, if we do things in the right way, we can, we can, nurture things back to health and um, that certainly opened my eyes to what's possible anyway. As the afternoon wore on I began to feel as if we covered a lot of ground however I wanted to get a better idea of Alex as an angler so I asked him to describe his approach to carp fishing. Well like I said before it's time 
time is is my greatest asset being here long enough <laughs> if i'm not on the fish i'll find them eventually and and that's definitely half the, tr the 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 battle isn't it is is watching the lake is absolutely watching the lake and i think even with a float and a hook you know once you've found the fish you've got a chance of catching them it doesn't really matter so much at that point if you're if you've got you know 15 hooks on a <laughs> on a contraption or you know you're fishing fishing just a hook and a float i think um for me in my ex small little experience it's definitely just knowing that you're near a fish in the first place <laughs> that helps and on a lot of these waters that is half the challenge because you can be miles away from them so i don't know if that answers the question but um there's de there's definitely i'm definitely doing nothing special you know bait wise rig wise technic technic technicality wise you've seen it all before when was the last time you went into a tackle shop <laughs> um when was the last time i went into a tackle shop two months ago in england in england because i didn't have any tackle with me so and i went and bought a couple of uh i think packs of hooks and some mono or something uh, um because i was fishing in a lake like a couple of local lakes but other than that, probably years ago. It's, it's funny, like, um, I kind of make whatever I have last, really, and that, that I, I am so fortunate to be able to, you know, to have people like yourselves be kind enough to give equipment here and there when it's necessary. Um, and that's, you know, served its purpose, you know. I, I'm, I, I was, every piece of equipment I ever owned was always secondhand. And it was always well used. So my rods were 15 years old, you know, when I bought them. <laughs> and my bivvy was uh, pretty much the same. Um, it was more of a sieve than a bivvy. And I, 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 yet I still fish with it, you know, like all my gear was ancient and, and kind of dilapidated, but it worked and I would repair and stitch everything that was broken. And I've always had that mentality. That I want to make it last. I don't see the point in in, in replacing new things, you know, for this reason or that reason. I, it's just never resonated with me. Um, that said, it's really wonderful when you've got a bivvy that doesn't leak on you, and when a sleep, you've got a sleeping bag that isn't for, you know, isn't freezing cold, and it does change the experience a little bit, you know, to have a bit of comfort. Um, and I wouldn't want, there's no other place I'd rather be than camped up by a lake. You know, I've proved that to myself because I've done it extensively over the last four years, you know, and I still absolutely love being here. Uh, I really do. It's just, um, whenever I get by the water, I, it takes me a day or two to just sort of switch off my my other mind, or so to speak, and, and then I can just be here and totally love every moment of it. And uh, I think, um, doesn't get much better than setting up your own little camp and and cooking and, and having tea and just and just watching the water and letting it have taken its effect on you you know it definitely there's no doubt about it being by water has a profound effect on the way in which we all feel whether we notice it or not there is a profound change in in the way in which I certainly feel when I'm by by the lakes or in amongst the forest by a lake or you know I'm always drawn to a river or a lake or even the sea um, there's just something about it I think it might be the the way it's so hypnotic when the wind is lapping against it or um, when it's dead calm and you can see bubbles just coming up and there's it's very hard to describe in terms of words but there's a feeling with each moment you know and um, I think everyone can relate to it when you kind of all of a sudden you just you just wake up out of your uh, for let me speak from my own perspective I can be really in my own head here doing what it is you know fishing putting the bait out thinking about what I'm doing then there's a moment when I just look out and I can feel it I really sense it it's like this is the moment this is the right moment and it's going to happen or you know the water's dead calm and there's something that just tells you that it's a really tangible moment and it's something that's felt really deeply and you, there's not much more you can really say about it other than that it's a, it's a kind of magic moment you know and, and it's just so wonderful to um, it's just it's just nice to appreciate those those uh, to appreciate being alive really I think that's what it is 
um, I can very easily, like most people, be quite busy in my mind, thinking too much, and, and, and it's just letting go of all of that and just being present that I really get, I think that fishing has brought from, to me at least. We talked until it got dark, when we reeled in both our rods before Alex went out in the boat to top up the spots with bait. Although fish were clearly feeding in the area, we decided to halve the amount we put in, in the hope that they would have a better chance of finding the hook bait the following day. As the cool mist rolled across the lake, Alex and I sipped on hot drinks to keep us warm, and talked of how we hoped today would be the day we connected with the carp from this wonderful place. We didn't have to wait long to find out, as Alex's bite alarm signalled a take and he swiftly donned the life jacket and took to the water to commence battle away from the other lines and the snaggy margins before us. With Alex and his prize, a mirror in immaculate condition, safely back on the bank, we took our time to admire its perfection while I captured the moment on my camera. We were both overjoyed to have a fish on the bank so early in the day, yet neither of us needed to say that we hoped it wasn't the last. With Alex's rod now back out on the spot, we speculated as to whether it might have been reducing the amount of bait we'd put in that brought about the bite, or whether it might have been down to the subtle changes we'd both made to our rigs. Whatever the case may have been, we, or more so Alex, was doing something right, and he was soon back out in the boat playing his second car for the day. Only this one had took full control, and was literally dragging Alex wherever it wanted to go, signalling to us that this could be a big fish indeed. Back on the bank I was greeted by the sight of Alex peeling back the retention sling to reveal the giant scales of a magnificent common that looked like it might have been well upwards of 50 pounds, perhaps even nearer to 60 had Alex chosen to weigh it. The condition of both of these fish was incredible, and as I snapped away taking shots of Alex with this huge common, I secretly wished that the next bite would be on one of my rods. However, this wasn't to be the case. I would moved Alex's remaining rod so that he could manoeuvre the boat back into the swim easier with the large common in his landing net. I'd placed the rod in the reeds to our left and just as we were finishing doing some pictures of Alex returning the fish, we heard the clutch of that rod begin to tick away, signalling that Alex would be going straight back out in the boat for his third boat battle of the day. After another battle out in the boat, Alex had returned with another of this amazing lake's gems, another mirror and again looking like it had never seen a hook in its life. After three days of no action, Alex had now banked three incredible alpine carp we both felt a sense of relief that we were at least doing something right. I might not have caught a fish of my own, but experiencing these captures with Alex in this amazing setting, mountains all around us, was intoxicating, and it was easy to see why Alex was so drawn to this region. Once photographs had been taken, Alex released the carp back into the lake, and once I'd watched it disappear into the depths, I looked up at the sun slowly descending to where it would fall behind the mountains over our shoulders, I knew that the likelihood of me getting a bite were diminishing too. Soon we were once again wrapped in darkness, signalling that it was time to wind in for the night, and I knew that my chances of banking a mountain carp of my own were gone, as tomorrow morning I'd have to hit the road if I wanted to make my train home in time. The following morning I decided to fish for the last three hours I figured I could squeeze into the session, and put my rods out at first light. Alex was still asleep, but had baited heavily with boilies after we reeled in last night, planning on resting the swim through the morning and putting his rods back out in the afternoon after I'd left. On a personal level, I'd already had a truly memorable experience travelling to the Alps and catching up with Alex, but I couldn't help feeling gutted as my last remaining couple of hours became minutes, and despite spotting some fizzing in a couple of shows over the spots, the bobbins remained motionless. We ate breakfast and decided that all was not lost, as at least having a score to settle was a perfect reason to come back and fish with Alex again in the future. I'd resigned myself to a blank and had started to pack the cameras away when the carp gods finally took pity on me and the left hand rod signalled a take. 
playing a fish from a boat is a rare occurrence for me and I nervously hung on while I worked out how to stay in some degree of control as it went on a series of short but powerful runs before I eventually bundled the beast over the net cord to claim my first mountain carp. Peering into the net, I saw a golden flank common and punched the air in triumph before rowing back to the bank where Alex was waiting with a grin stretched right across his face, as happy as I was that I'd bagged one before I left. With the capture, I felt an imaginary weight lift from my shoulders, allowing me to think more clearly and truly appreciate just being there in that moment. Alex's statement of beautiful places make for beautiful experiences couldn't have been more apt. It's little wonder why anglers who have made the effort to search out and find waters like these like to keep a lot of details to themselves. And as Alex snapped away with his camera, I couldn't help but think how fortunate I was to not only be experiencing all of this for myself, but to have made a friend in someone so willing to invite me into his world. Amidst the elation of the capture, part of me felt a tinge of sadness at the thought of having to tear myself away from this paradise, reminding me to enjoy the moment while it lasted. I held on to my prize, allowing it to recover in the water as Alex took a few more photographs until I got the feeling that it was ready to go and watched it swim away strongly, disappearing from our world and back into its own, just as I would soon have to leave Alex in the mountains and return to mine. Throughout our time together I'd noticed Alex was in tune with nature and his own environment more than he was with whatever was going on in the world of carp angling. It was clear that experiences meant more than things and I hoped we could close the interview by talking about the importance of looking after what we've got so that future generations might enjoy it too. I've kind of forgotten about that the, the kind of UK scene in a way because I've been out of it for so long, although that's not true. I did, I did kind of come and fish the UK a little bit in the summer and I realised how busy these lakes are. And it is, <laughs> it, I can, it, it's enjoyable for any, any getting out. That was it, that was what I wanted to say because you were talking about, you know, like spent a lot of time in nature. But I realised that we, in, even with the words we use, we separate ourselves from the equation because we see ourselves as separate from nature and we go into nature, but we are nature, you know, and that's the, the you know, the thing is we don't ever leave nature. We're always in nature. Um, we're in this fleshy suit, which is nature, you know, so um, I don't see there's a separation and it's just, I think it's our language structure and our, our perception that divides us from it. Because when we, when we realise there is no separation, then it's like, okay, so, if, if nature and I are, in, in a sense, part of the same um, sphere or domain, then I wouldn't want to pollute myself to, what a certain, to the point of, you know, destruction, because I quite enjoy living and being alive, is, being alive is a great thing. So, you know, I think as we destroy the environment, we destroy ourselves in a way. So it's, you, you know, harming harms the self without exception. So it's kind of, uh, in a way, important that if we want to maintain ourselves, then we also want to maintain the environment we're in and let, let nature do its thing, you know, because it's supremely intelligent and, um, and doesn't need our intervention to fix it, really.